Last week you, you uh, looked at the faith test and what it, uh, your concept of God, that kind of thing in the little booklet. Mm -hmm. You remember going through that? Yeah. And how much that affects us because everything's driving us to God, but what is your concept of God? And we said that if you had a critical father, you probably put on a pair of glasses and you read everything you're doing wrong in the Bible. If you had a father that exploded, you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop and God's going to explode and get you. If you had a passive father, then you feel like under pressure that God's not going to act. If you had a father to abandon you, you'll feel like he aban he'll abandon you. If he helped others but he didn't help you, then of course God's going to help others and he's not going to help you. And we looked at how important it was, and Jeff looked at that with you, of having the proper concept of who God is because we're being driven to Christ. Well, the thing I want to look at today, and we'll revisit it a little bit and add some things to it, but also having a proper concept of who the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit wants to fill me and not only does he want to fill me but the Holy Spirit wants to surround me and so what is our concept of the Holy Spirit and uh, as I look at some of these things uh, you look I'm looking at it from the outside looking in and so don't take uh, everything I'm saying is just mocking people um, I mean, as, as uh, believers, we've all done things that we didn't understand and we didn't, we didn't have the knowledge then that we have now, so we're not really mocking people. But I am looking at how the Holy Spirit is portrayed and how many people look at it from the outside and why they're actually fearful of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's very important because uh, Jesus says enough in this verse, John 14, 16, to tear up every Bible school but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And the things of God won't come through an education, but they come through a revelation. And we know that because the disciples had the best teaching that anyone could have. And the end result of their good teaching after three and a half years is they locked themselves behind doors and they hid. And so we think that good teaching will carry us and it won't carry us. But what will carry us is the Holy Spirit. And revelation comes from the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we need a model of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's an amazing thing to me. You were created to have a spirit dwell in you. So you were made for a spirit. Uh, in Haiti, which I found this interesting, and, and as people brought it out, they crucified him. I know they crucified Pat Robertson. But Haiti made a, a, a pact with the devil, with the voodoo priests, uh, for 200-year control of Haiti. And uh, if you look at Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic flourishes, and Haiti is a dump. And Haiti's the center of voodoo for the whole world, and, and Plain de Nord is the, is the main city for voodoo. In the city of Plain de Nord, there's a pool of blood about 12 times the size of this room. And it's blood and mud and there's chicken heads and goat heads and ox heads hanging and axles and candles. And it's a wild place. And uh, you go down in there, the women go down, and they take off their clothes and the priests rub the blood and the mud all over them until they become demon-possessed. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing place. To see it in Uruguay, they have a demonic, uh, <coughs> actually a demonic conference every year where people come to the ocean and they worship the god of the sea and they get in circles and then people get in the center of the circle and they become demon possessed. Uh, one of my friends, uh, that one-eyed evangelist I was talking about, he got a circle of a bunch of uh, pastors together and everybody thought he was in one of the demon groups and so they would come into his circle to get possessed and the demons would leave him. So it was, <coughs> that was a lot of fun. and. Uh, <laughs> And they had it on national TV and everything, too. He was enjoying it. In between that, he was singing more, uh, 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 yeah, opera, Spanish opera. Uh, he, he likes that. In uh, Borneo one time, uh, when I was there, we were going through a village, and there was a man there, and they built a big fire, and he would run and jump into the fire, and he would throw himself back into the fire, and the flames would lick around him. And I told some of you about that. Not even a hair on his ha hand would be burned. And uh, he would roll out of the fire. And this young pastor I was with cast the demon out of him. And when the demon came out, you know what the fellow said? Now how will I make a living? 
And we assume when someone has a demon that the demon ought to be cast out. But that's not always true. And I said, well, tell him not to worry about it because there's a lot more where that one came from. <laughs> and he'll have some more tomorrow and he can throw himself in the fire and people give him a little donation. But the fact is we're created to have a spirit dwelling in us. And isn't it amazing that Legion had 7,000 demons? A legion is 7,000 demons. Now that begs the question, how big is a demon? I mean, is it this big or is it that big? I mean, how, 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 does, it, how does it measure up? How do you get 7,000 demons in you? So that could be one question. But the other obvious thing to me would be is whatever space 7,000 demons take up, the Holy Spirit can fill. So how big is this one spirit called the Holy Spirit when he can take the place of 7,000 demons? We're supposed to have the spirit dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit, not another spirit, and we're made for a spirit. The question I have is, do you want the Holy Spirit as presented dwelling in you? Now, I'm detached a lot from what happens in, in the U.S. and in the West. I know that. Um, I'm not there that often. I don't even know what's going on most of the time. But sometimes <coughs> in other countries, I get on the late night television, I watch the televangelist. And I have to do it out of the country because Betty's forbidden it in the house. <laughs> because I turn on the televangelist and then, you know how you get mad and you're talking at the TV and you're telling the TV this and you're, Tell the guy that, and you're telling him what an idiot he is, and that she, she can't take that. So I have to wait till I'm out of the country and sneak in and turn on the, and get the late night television. And some of these people, you just wonder who, who in the world are they? And, and their portrayal of the Holy Spirit. And there's one woman on TV that's always full of the Holy Spirit. And honestly, she needs just a couple of her girlfriends to take her for tea some morning, and reach across the table and grab her hands and look at her straight in the face and say. Um, honey, that's too much makeup. <laughs> that, that hair is too high. That, that's just too much. People don't really look like that. You look like the bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> but she's full of the Holy Spirit, and she's screaming, and she's yelling. And, and, and I saw one guy who just bought a $30 million jet, and he already owned one $30 million jet. But if God calls you to go, you need to be able to go, and you can't count on a jet being broken down. Like if God called me to go, he couldn't fix my jet. And so he's got a $30 million jet, but the Holy Spirit has told him to do that. I was in Brazil, and they had a big meeting there. The people paid $100 each to come to it. Biggest stock, uh, soccer stadium in South America. He comes in. He's got choirs there singing the people, singing the people, singing them. He comes late. He's coming. He's coming. They keep saying he's coming. Finally, he comes in on a helicopter. He gets out of the helicopter, takes off his coat, walks on the stage, and he flings it on the stage, and it starts going across the stage, and everybody that went in front of him just fell back, just fell back, just hundreds of people just fell back. And then he got out his hands, and he acted like he was shooting, and he was going like this, like this, and the rows of choirs would just fall down, fall down, fall down. And then to show his ultimate power, which was, this was great, his ultimate power, he touched himself and went out. <laughs> and, and I said, if only he'd have done that first. <laughs> he'd have just... As he was getting out of the helicopter, touched his own forehead, I, I would have been happy as Larry. And, I mean, what is seed money? You know, we need to give our seed money. And, and I saw a guy on TV, I'm not joking, he, he, he starts to read and he says, uh, we're going to read today Psalms 119.19. 19. Yes, Holy Spirit, I hear. I'm sorry, I've never seen it before, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, but I've never noticed this before. But Psalms 119, 19 is 11,919. And the first 11,919 people that send me their monthly house payment, God is going to pay off their house. And it doesn't matter if your house payment's $100 or $1,200 or $10,000. Just send it in. He's going to pay it off. We're taking the calls right now. And the phones start ringing over there. And, you, and he said, and you know what? I can't believe no man of God ever pointed this out to me. And I thought, well, no, duh. <laughs> you know, so no man of God ever told you that 119.19 meant everybody could pay off your, 
pay off your house. And, and why are people screaming at the devil all the time? Screaming and yelling, and why is being full of the Holy Spirit getting louder and louder and louder and shouting and screaming? I, I, I don't understand that. And I'm just thinking of someone standing out and looking in and saying, this is a bit strange. I mean, I, I really don't know that I want to be full of the Holy Spirit and start acting the way those people are acting. Uh, it, it's a strange thing to look. And what I really see is, is that men are projecting what they believe the power of the Holy Spirit looks like in a man. They're acting. So if I hire one of you women to act like Margaret Thatcher, you're going to watch a few videos of Margaret Thatcher, I assume, and then you're going to try to act like you think Margaret Thatcher acted. Well, we don't have videos to see how people acted when they were full of the Holy Spirit, and so we do have people modeling that, and we end up modeling that. And really what it is, it's acting, it's projecting what we believe the power of the Holy Spirit ought, ought to really look like, and we're only projecting it through ourselves and what it would look like through us and through our flesh, and it's no wonder to me that people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. Now, you need the Holy Spirit. We have to have it. And so before God ever says, invite the Holy Spirit into you, be filled with the Holy Spirit, what he does is he sends his son to reveal to us exactly what the Holy Spirit will do in me. And so I can have confidence when I invite this Holy Spirit to come. What will it do in me? Well, it's used interchangeably. We'll talk about it later in Ephesians. But the Holy Spirit is used interchangeably. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus. And so what, uh, whatever Jesus did, the Holy Spirit wants to duplicate in me and actually live through me. And so we can expect from the Holy Spirit whatever we see in Jesus. And what did we see in Jesus? We saw a carpenter that lived a daily life and had an abundant life. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your job will no longer be mundane. But you can have a wonderful life in your job. Because he lived, and wouldn't you like to have a chair that Jesus made? Wouldn't that be neat? And I really got a question for him. Uh, what about all the people that died and went to hell while he was making those chairs? What was his priority? What was he doing? Why was he building chairs? Why wasn't he out there doing something? Where was his heart for the lost? Uh, but he lived life daily, and it was abundant for him in whatever he did. He made the best person feel in need, and the worst person could sense hope. And a failure could approach him, and they would find in him acceptance. And he was holiness that served. And he was never terrible, but he was tender. And children sat on his knees. And strong men bowed their knees to him. He proclaimed the truth and he let it argue for itself. He wasn't debating all the time. He didn't proclaim God. He brought him because he was transparent. And we think that it was nails that held him to the cross. And that's a lie. It was love that held him there. And if we're seeking the Holy Spirit and to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we see in Christ what the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish in us. And when I ask these questions, I answer them at the same time that I, that I ask them. Did he ever go off into visions and dreams? Did he ever traffic in the mysterious? Was there ever anything psychopathic about him? Wasn't he always poised and balanced and sound? And was he ever distracted by a minor issue? Just a minute, just a minute. There's someone here with a headache. <laughs> There's someone here that's got a headache. Uh, <laughs> I knew it wasn't you. You didn't have to. Uh, <laughs> There's someone here that didn't sleep well last night. Uh, there's somebody here that's worried about things at home. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, it's like the Indian fortune teller. You walk past him and he says, uh, you look happy, but deep down inside I think something is wrong. Well, he just hit 80% of the people <laughs> that walked past him that day. 
Now, if somebody there has a headache and they have this and they have that, why don't you tell them what their name is and what God wants to do? And instead of playing those kind of games with people. And uh, I, I was at a meeting where a fellow was doing that, and at the end of the meeting, I just stood up and I said to the people, I don't believe that. And let me tell you that some of you are struggling with your kids, and you'll be struggling next year when I see you. And some of you are struggling in your marriage, you'll be struggling next year when I see you. And those things will go on. But I'm going to ask you next year when I see you, do you still love Jesus? And if you say yes, I'll bow my heart to you. Because you've hung in there with him, and you've waited, and the greatness of faith isn't what you receive, but how long you can wait and receive it. And so we get into all these games. And, I mean, it was unbelievable. With, with one fellow, I just stood there in awe because he said, uh, how many people here have a need and, they, and that they want to have met? And it can be from a family to a healing. Everybody raised their hand, about almost 1,000 people. Well, if you believe that God uh, has healed you and given that to you, keep your hand up. But if you don't keep your hand up, it means you don't have the faith to receive it, so you won't get it. Good. So the thousand people keep their hand up. And now your healing might not come right away. It may come later. But if you're going to ha go ahead and receive it today as though it did come today, go ahead and keep your hand up. But if you don't, you're not going to get it. And everybody kept their hand up. And he said, I'm going to go back to my church and report there were a thousand healings. Uh, that kind of thing is unbelievable in the church and no wonder people are afraid of the Holy Spirit Jesus comes and he reveals to me what the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish in me now I'd like you to look at the Holy Spirit in a different way because again we use terms but we don't have definition and so the Father and the Son in their fellowship and in their intimacy create an atmosphere and that atmosphere is a holy atmosphere, isn't it? And we know that people that were caught up into heaven and found themselves there, the first thing they would say is, I'm a man of unclean lips. So here's the father and son together in their fellowship. In their intimacy, they create an atmosphere of holiness. When people were caught up into that atmosphere, they would see themselves as people of unclean lips because only the things of God make sense in this atmosphere of God. That's all that would make sense. And anything that's anti-God or anti-Christ in me is going to be amplified in a big way. Now, these two together, the Father and the Son, in their fellowship, give birth to this atmosphere, which is another word in the Greek for atmosphere, is spirit. Now, the spirit is a person. But you do know this. Have you ever gone to a, to a home where there's a spirit of conflict. And it's an atmosphere of conflict. So there's a spirit of conflict that has around it an atmosphere of conflict. And you don't mean to be caught up in the conflict, and you are caught up in the conflict. Have you ever gone any place where there's a spirit of joy, and around that spirit is an atmosphere of joy, and you're caught up in the joy, and you find yourself laughing and you didn't attend to? And you can also walk into a room and see a young boy and a young girl together, and you look at them and you see there's a spirit of love there and around that spirit of love is that atmosphere of love and you can look at the, at the boy and tell he's just hormones and loafers, you know, but he's really excited about this, about this girl. Now, the Holy Spirit that proceeds from the Father and the Son, that spirit is a Holy Spirit and surrounding that Holy Spirit, that person, is an atmosphere of holiness. Does that make sense? Now, if I have a go at you men, you may put up with it. If I start taking your wives off, you may say, hey, that's enough. But if I start taking your kids off, you say, that is really enough. You're not doing that to someone that innocent. Jesus said, you can say what you want to the Father, and you can say what you want about me, but if you blaspheme, the spirit that we gave birth to that comes out of us, that's the very best that can come out of us, there's no forgiveness now or in the future for that. Because the Holy Spirit is the very best thing that comes out of God. And so the Holy Spirit is a person that proceeds from the Father and the Son and brings with him 
all of the holiness of the Father and all of the holiness of the Son. Is there any questions over that? Sure. You just said that, that, hang on, that if you uh, blaspheme Jesus, there's no forgiveness on that one. As if they realize what they've done and the Holy Spirit. Well, what I was saying is, yeah, the Holy Spirit. Because that's the very best that comes out of the Father, and if you can't recognize that, you're really in trouble. What if they do recognize, but is that different? Like, well, it, uh, that, that, that'll take us back to our topic of forgiveness, and I think, of course, that the blood of Christ is going to cover that, too. Because we already said that uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was, the, here's the very best that comes out of God, and I'm equating that to Satan. And he goes, there's no forgiveness for that now or later, so there's no sacrifice for that in the Old Testament. And you're really sunk if you've done that. And the whole point was then, now I do need you, Jesus. Because you are the sacrifice for that also. Okay? But my point here would be that, that I want to make is that the Father and Son together do create or give birth to, in one way, a person called the Holy Spirit that possesses the holiness that comes out of both of them and the very best that there is of God. And surrounding that, spirit is an atmosphere of absolute holiness now here's what happens then with that <coughs> is you remember David was caught up and he was in the Holy Spirit do you know when he was in the Holy Spirit only the things of God make any sense to you in the Holy Spirit and so when you're in the Holy Spirit it makes sense to walk with God, to not worry, to see your enemy and not kill him, to have peace, to wipe your face and get up and to go on again, because the things of God make sense. And Jesus sent the disciples out in the Holy Spirit. And when they went out in the Holy Spirit, dwelling in, the pre in this atmosphere of God, or this spirit that is surrounded by that atmosphere of God, when they went out in that do you know they didn't mind it that they had no friends and that they were cut off from their country and they didn't have extra clothes and they didn't have money and they didn't have food and they had people pitted against them? It didn't bother them at all because the things of God make perfect sense to you when you're in the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus says that he'll do something that's very, very unique and it was simply this, that you've been walking in the Holy Spirit but when I go back to the Father what I'm going to do is bring that Holy Spirit or send that Holy Spirit to come and actually dwell in you and you'll have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you now not only will you be walking in the Spirit and so the things outside of you that are of God make perfect sense but when you're filled with the Spirit the things of God inside of you will make perfect sense. Do you know the amazing thing about Acts is, is we read everything that they were doing and they were doing all of it without a commandment. Because the things of God made sense to them. And I remember the day that I became a believer and that moment I stopped drugs and I stopped the drinking and I stopped the running around and I stopped cursing and I started giving money and I started handing out Bibles and I started witnessing to people and I was praying and do you know I had no one to disciple me I, knew, I didn't know another Christian I did all of that without any commandment because in the Holy Spirit the things of God make sense but when you're filled with the Holy Spirit only the things of God make sense in me now here's the beautiful thing to me about it is these things that were the outward manifestations of my sin and a life in the flesh and a carnal life and an unbelieving life fell off of me naturally because I was in the Spirit. When I seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that means that he's going to take the things that are not of Christ away naturally and he's going to bring the things that are of Christ into my life naturally and he's going to grant me the grace to lift up Jesus inside me and outside of me. Every morning I get up and I just say this, I want to walk in the Holy Spirit today. So Holy Spirit, will you surround me everywhere I go 
and that no matter where I am, only the things of God make sense to me, only the things of heaven, and that the things of the flesh won't make any sense. And then will you fill me, Holy Spirit, and comfort me by taking away everything that's not of him and bringing everything that is of him, and then would you grant me the grace to lift up Christ? Do you know the miracles of God can be copied, can't they? And because Moses copied the miracles, and so we know that the miracles of God can be copied. The gifts of the Holy Spirit can be copied. I've seen them copied all over Africa. All the gifts get copied. Uh, do you know that the fruit of the Holy Spirit can be copied? Just watch a Hindu sadhu and you'll see lots of peace and patience and kindness. They're, co- they're one-offs, but they're copying it. But there are a couple of things that are proof of the filling of the Holy Spirit that can never be copied. And one of those things is where the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is lifted up. And do you notice this when you pray? If you start praying to, G, uh, to the Holy Spirit, soon you'll find yourself praying to Jesus and soon you'll find yourself praying to the Father because the Holy Spirit witnesses to him and he witnesses to the Father and he takes you to the Father. And so when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we ought to be talking about him. Another thing that the Holy Spirit will never copy is the conviction of things that are anti-Christ. He doesn't copy those kind of things. I mean, the, the enemy won't copy that, the conviction of things that are, that are not of Christ. And the Holy Spirit does convict me of the things that are not of him. And so I want the Holy Spirit because what it's going to do is ultimately the life that I saw Christ live outwardly like a sparrow becomes mine. And the life that he lived inwardly in peace and in rest and in trust in God becomes my life too. And so I want those things of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> when Jesus was born, they wrapped him in linen. How many people came to see the linen? Nobody. And when the Holy Spirit came, he was clothed with tongues of fire. The clothes are not the thing that are the most important. The fact is, and the thing that is the most important, is the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you. The Spirit of Heaven that has an atmosphere of God all the way around it, who is God, came and dwelt in me and brings the things of God. And so the clothes aren't the most important thing. And you can tell where the Holy Spirit is because where the Holy Spirit is, there's no special places. If I was one of the disciples, the first place I would want to leave is Jerusalem because it was the place of my failure. Now, how many of you want to flee the place of your failure? And we want to get away from it as quick as we can. And yet, they're told that when the Holy Spirit comes, the place of your failure will be the launching point of the greatest victory you ever imagined. Come and fill me, Holy Spirit, where I'm at. In my job, in my home, with my family, with my neighbor. Let it be the launching point for victory. Where the Holy Spirit is, there's no special people because we're all equal. And if the Holy Spirit is really in this room, there is no Christian caste. Where the Holy Spirit is, there's no sex discrimination because the Holy Spirit fell on women and men alike. And there's no age distinction because it fell on the young and the old. And there's no special races and there was no hoarding and there was no division. Where the Holy Spirit is, there's always freedom. I told some of you this story, uh, but we'll actually got better pictures this time. But uh, <clears throat> I'll get somewhere with this story, actually. It just takes a minute. But I went to Liberia during the war, and, and uh, I told uh, my interpreter that I wanted to go to the re- most remote place in all of, uh, let me get on in all of uh, Liberia. And so um, he rented me a four-wheel drive, a land uh, cruiser. And I got there and I opened the door to the land cruiser to get in and there were 13 people in it. It was just heads and colorful clothes, 13 people. And I said, how do do we go with 13 people on a 40-hour drive, nonstop, 40 hours? 
And he said, well, it's easy. We'll have two guys, one each on each one of your legs. You know, so you have an African here and an African here, and, and we'll go 40 hours. And I said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. I said, rent another land cruiser because we can't travel like that. It's too, it's too hard on us. So he rented another land cruiser, and guess what he did? <laughs> invited 13 more people. And at that, I just said, you can invite all you want. I don't care how many people you invite because this is my equal space. This is where I'm sitting. I paid for these land uh, cruisers, and I'm sitting right here. This is mine, my space. Nobody's sitting them in here. I don't care how you have. I don't care how many chickens are in the place. doesn't matter. You can ride on the roof, do whatever you want. This is my equal space. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't know that I'd have to trade off driving with both these guys when they got exhausted. So I drove the full 40 hours out there. And uh, it was quite a trip. But these were the roads. And this is how I just, we slugged it along hour after hour and this kind of stuff. And uh, they would come along, you know, and try to, and, you know, we'd have the Africans come and they would dig us out. And you might go uh, the length of a football field and then you get in. Uh, look how deep uh, this rut is right there. And so that's the rut, and it's actually uh, the top of the, the land cruiser is not above the rut. And we'd have to get in there and shovel that out and dig it out. And these are a couple of guys that I hired along the way, and uh, they really did work hard. But, and they rode on the top of the land cruiser. They just hung on and just, and just went with me. And they were digging this stuff out. But you can see how deep the rut is because it's clear over their heads. And it's 40 hours of this. And I'd already been up probably 10, 12 hours before I got going on, the, on this trip. And uh, so anyway, I get to the village. And when I get to the village, there's a huge eruption. And people are all around me. And I got all the kids that are looking in the window at me. And they'd never seen a white man before, and they're all screaming and yelling. And then, you know, they're sneaking up behind you to touch you to see if it comes off. And, and honestly, you know, white is not the most attractive color. Uh, the longer you're in the jungle like this, you just start looking sicker and sicker and sicker, <laughs> paler, you know. And they call you Mazuo because they've been told white people eat you. And uh, so the kids are all around. And I can't figure out what is all of this shouting about and screaming and yelling. And running, well, I find out, and these people had really suffered uh, for a long time in the war. They had their clothes stripped from them at one point. The whole village burnt, about 3,000 in the interior. But they had an ancient prophecy that one day a white man would come, and when he came, you were to make him a chief and give him the land, and then he would talk to you about his God. And so they were scared to death because I'd showed up. And so there I am after being up 50 hours, a chief. And uh, so they took me in to see the chiefs, and, and they all explained to me, and they're, they're pretty serious, and they're, they're pretty frightened. And then they give me to take home to Betty a white chicken. And so I had my white chicken to take back with me, which was really nice. And then they took me into a, uh, where was that? Yeah, into the hut. And we had a chief's hut, and the witch doctors come, and all the witch doctors are women, and they have ash on their face because ash comes from the ground, and they never can make eye contact with any person because they're overseeing the spirits of the ancestors that are dead in the ground. And so they have the ash on their face, and they walk like this the whole time down, and then the chiefs came, and they dressed me in a beautiful white robe, and it was embroidered. It was really nice, and a hat and every, everything. And... Uh, I asked one of the ladies, I go, how do I look? And she said, too fine. So I, had, you know, I had that on, I'm dressed as a chief, and then they name me, and they give me my name. And then the last part of the ceremony is, is that he has this big bottle of uh, sugar cane uh, alcohol. And uh, so I don't know what that is, 180 proof, you know, but it's the real thing. <laughs> and uh, so they have that. And to seal the ceremony, they send the chief's son over, and he gives me a glass of this, uh, of this stuff to drink. And it's a glass about like this of the sugar cane alcohol. And I'd been up then. I was pushing about 60 hours. And so he gave me that, and it's the final ceremony. I'm ready to get it over with. And so I had the stuff, and, and the interpreter grabbed my hand, and he said, hey, we're Christians. We don't drink. And I said, yeah, well, if I don't drink this, Will the chiefs be offended? And he goes, uh-huh. 
And I said, if I don't drink it, will I be chief? And he says, uh-uh. And I said, and if I don't drink it, the warriors back there with the machetes and stuff, are they going to be mad? And he goes, uh-huh. And I just looked at him and went, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and I chugged the thing down, you know, and just chugged it down and looked at him like, well, you get killed because I'm going, <laughs> going on my way, Chief Gabani. And so I headed off, and I went through there, and I wanted to see what my village looked like and, you know, what I possessed and what I need to do with it. And, Everybody was showing me my little, my willage. And <clears throat> actually, this picture I just threw in to show you because I had another one about a snake. But uh, I was in the Amazon just a few months ago in the interior, uh, one of the, mo the most remote area you can be. They do jungle training for the military. And they feed them a couple days, and they throw them out in the jungle and say, let's see if you can live. And so these guys were really thrilled because they caught an anaconda, and they hadn't eaten for several days, so they were going to eat. But look at the size of that anaconda. I mean, that's the real thing. Uh, so they had that thing. But anyway, I'm with my interpreter, and I went in the toilet, and it's a little toilet about this big. I said, I'm going somewhere with this story, but the toilet's about this big, and the door swings in, so I got to suck clear against the wall, and then I close it, and it's pitch black in there, and you squat over this hole. And then I came out, and my interpreter went in, and he was gone for about 30 minutes and he came out just pale and I said Amos what's wrong I said are you sick you doing all right you got diarrhea and he said no did you see what was in the corner of that toilet and I said I saw a big pile there and I thought why don't you people clean your toilets he said pile that was a that was a uh, puff adder which is one of the most poisonous snakes in uh, in Africa and he said I was squatting over the hole and saw the puff adder and it was raised up you know next to my knee and he said you move very slowly when you when you're squatting over a hole with a puff at her and I said I guess so and uh, I closed the door to take a picture of the thing but that thing was in there and then they decided to do me a favor they would uh, make a bath for me and I thought okay well I need a bath I've been up now 60 some hours and they took reeds and put them about this high on the, around in a circle and put a bucket of water there and I went over and stripped down, had all my clothes laying on the reeds. And I looked up, and there's 200 Africans watching me. <laughs> Just watching me take a bath, because they'd never seen a white guy take a bath before. And that's when I was glad I had the drink, because I said, no, I don't care. And I was just taking the thing and taking it and throwing it over. It didn't matter to me. I was shot. I was just done, you know. And so, so I took my bath in front of everybody and dried off in front of everybody. I said, amen. And uh, they took me to the room where they built me a, a, a cot. And the cot looked like it was moving, and I shined a flashlight on it. And there were cockroaches that big. <laughs> just covered it, just covered the whole bed. So I shooed them off and I laid down and I was out like that. And when I woke up in the morning, my head was stuck this way and I peeled it away and it was just, it was cracking when it peeled away. And then my arms peeled away and they came up and I looked and all night long I was so asleep, the cockroaches would cover me and then I'd roll in my sleep and I'd crush them all. <laughs> And then I'd roll this way and I'd crush them all. And I'd crush them back and forth. So I was crushing all these cockroaches. So I'm just dipped in cockroach juice. <laughs> and uh, I call Amos and I said, Amos. And he came running in the room. He said, what do you need? And I said, call all the people together that didn't see me get a bath yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going back out there for another bath. I didn't care who saw me. I wasn't going to do that. Well, I had a great week there, uh, two weeks there ministering. And... Um, I showed them the movie, The Passion of Christ. I brought a generator with me and showed it on, on the wall. They'd never heard a radio or seen a TV. So this thing nearly backfired on me because of the, uh, you know, the soldiers on the wall of, the, of one of the buildings, and they were afraid they were going to come off and all that kind of thing. But anyway, I stayed there, got ready to leave, and I was walking to the Land Rover with my, you know, a tear in my eye, and I heard Amos say to the chiefs, see how much he loves the people? I turned to Amos and I said, Amos, I do love the people, but I'm not crying because of that. I'm crying because we've got to get back in that Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's another 40 hours. 
And I told the guy that I rented the second one from, don't worry, the roads are fine, nothing will happen to it. By then, it lost both bumpers. I didn't have the hood on it, and I'd lost a fender. Had them all tied on the top. And in the end, I had to leave it in the jungle. It completely broke down. But, so we headed out on that trip, said goodbye to everybody. And they had a little, little party for me. And I moved along uh, riding. And they, um, there's a giant rat in Africa that people like to eat. And so what we'd do is they'd hang at the side of the road. And in Liberia, they're very expensive, but out here they're cheap. So every time we saw one, that's one quarter of the rat. That's just a fourth. Uh -huh. And so every time they were hanging on a tree, we had to stop and we had to buy those rats. And so you've got 13 people in the car and about 15 chunks of rat. You can imagine <laughs> the smell in there and the heat. And then they were picking up chickens. And the chickens would just float around. It was so miserable in there, they'd finally just fall over dead. <laughs> And it was the only time I ever lusted to be a chicken. I just thought if I'd just die and be the end of it, I'd be happy. And then um, uh, we went along and we didn't have any food. So what we'd do is when, we, when we'd drive through the bugs and they had just swarms of them, they'd get on the windshield and you'd turn on the windshield and they'd drop off onto the hood. The hood was hot and they'd roast. And then when you got enough, on them on, enough of them roasted, you just stopped and you ate those. And uh, so I was eating, eating those as I went along. When they finally got to me to my hotel, and I've been out two weeks on this trip, they get in my hotel. I just looked in the mirror and I took a self-portrait. <laughs> and this is what I, that's just, I was just gone. I was just barely there. And uh, I, I, saw, I saw a chicken in the village and I thought, well, if I could only be like that chicken at the end of this trip. You know, so I took a picture of the chicken. <laughs> and you know that's how I felt I mean that was the inner man but the thing that impressed me about the chicken is that it still had its head up you know <laughs> and I thought if, if only I could go like that and and end up with my head in the air and kind of a bit of a strut even though there's nothing left but but uh I didn't look that good. I looked like this. That was me right there, just done. And uh, so I got there, and they said, well, in the morning, uh, your flight leaves at 10.15, and, and we'll, take you off, uh, we'll take you off on your flight. And I said, okay, that's great. And uh, <clears throat> so they called me at uh, about 8 in the morning, and they said, don't get up, just sleep in, because they've canceled your flight and it won't leave until this afternoon. And I thought, great, you know, because I can use the extra three, four hours of sleep. So I went ahead and slept. And, and uh, they said, flight leaves at four. You don't need to be there till three. They picked me up. I got there at three. And I walked up and uh, I said, yeah, I'm on, on the flight to uh, Malawi. And they said, your flight left at 10 this morning. Where were you? And I said, what? They said, yeah, it left at 10 this morning. And I said, no, they told me it was late. They go, no, the flight wasn't late. This was a 4 o'clock flight to Belgium. And I said, well, what do I do? And they said, we canceled all your tickets. And so that was about, uh, I think what they canceled there was about $7,000 worth of tickets. Because I had to be in Malawi for a conference, South Africa, Madagascar, and one other place for a conference. They just canceled them all because I didn't make it. And I said, well, what do I do? And he, he said, well, you can buy a ticket for 2000 to Belgium, and then we'll recut your tickets from there for another eight. So I'm looking at about $17,000 I've lost right then because of these Africans. And the Africans knew it, and they were listening to all this. And I was so mad. And the Africans don't show each other any grace, so I knew it didn't matter to them if I was mad. But they were afraid. And I sat there. I was so angry. And I just said to the Lord, Lord, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I need peace before I kill someone and I mean I need it and the Lord spoke to me and he said it was me and I said what it was me I had him give you the wrong time I had you miss your flight I had you show up here it was all me it was me and I said it was you yeah, it was me. Because, Mike, you always want to be filled with the Holy Spirit 
So you'll have peace and you'll have patience and you'll have kindness. But a fruit tree never eats its own fruit. A vine never eats its own fruit. I'll fill you with the Holy Spirit and I'll give you the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but I won't give it for you. I'll only give it to you if you give it to the African that messed up your trip. And it was me. And I just sat there, and your options are pretty limited. <laughs> and I got up and I told the fellow, I said, just hang on for a minute. And I went back, and they're all there, and they've got their heads down. I said, everybody get in a circle, and they all got in a circle. I said, and everybody put your arms around each other, and they put their arms around each other. And I said, I have something to give you that's very important for me that you receive it. So it's very important that you receive it when I give it to you. Will you receive it? Will you take it as a gift? And they said, yes. And they're still all looking down. I said, here's what I want to give you. Now look at me. And they looked at me and I said, peace. Not as the world gives, but his peace. I want to give you peace. Will you receive peace from me? Will you be at peace right now? And I want to give you patience. And, and I want to bear, and, 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 I want, uh, and I just went through the gifts of the Spirit. I want to give you kindness. I want to give you goodness. I want to be faithfulness to you. Will you receive my faithfulness that I'll be faithful to you? Will you receive that from me? And they said they would receive it. They receive it. And then I said, brothers, it's not your fault. It was God. I never want you to talk about it among each other ever again. I don't want you blaming each other ever again. It was God. It was just God. But you have to receive what I'm giving you. And they said, we'll take it. Do you know in my 25 years of working in Africa, that had more impact than anything I've ever done? To get the gifts of the Spirit, I mean the fruit of the Spirit, and be able to give it. And uh, I went back and I told the guy, I said, let me call my travel agent. I called him on the satellite phone. He said, Mike, don't do anything for a minute. Call me in 15 minutes. So I called him in 15 minutes, and he said, I've got all your tickets reinstated. All you got to do is stay there in Liberia two more days, and I'll fly you straight to Malawi. You won't miss your conference. You'll be in the one in South Africa. You'll be in the one in... Nothing's going to miss, and it won't cost you a penny. Everything's sorted out. The whole thing's sorted out. But what was really wonderful was having fruit to give to others. And so, Holy Spirit... You're welcome in here. You're welcome all around this place that as we walk and as we move and as we fellowship together, as we experience the church, that all the things of heaven make sense to us, that we will live our lives like a sparrow, that every day has enough worry of its own. And so we're not going to worry about any more than what we have right now. And we're going to walk in the freedom that you said we could have in this world. And you're God. And now would you come and fill me? And there's a lot of things in me that I don't like, but I'm trusting you to take them away naturally. And would you bring the things of Christ naturally? And would you grant me grace to lift him up? And would you give me fruit this week that I can give to your people to eat? And then we'll be full and we'll be happy and filled. Amen.